All right, welcome. Uh, we're going to jump into module number two, excuse me, module number three, lesson number two, building the link state database. This particular lesson is actually uh, pretty important um, because this is where we learn about uh, really the, the um, just like we did with the IGRP where we learned about the topology database and and how the topology database was built and we learned about successors and feasible successors. Well, in this particular case, we're going to be learning about uh, really how the link state database is built, but what are all the different LSA types and and what are the different ways that we handle uh, different types of link state advertisements. Uh, and this is a precursor to what we're going to see even in the next lesson, which is how do we handle dealing with things like uh, special area types in OSPF. Uh, you know, we, we talked in EIGRP about building uh, stub routers and then doing summarization and, and how those aspects or how those components within uh, uh, EIGRP allowed us to build in scalability to the protocol. Well, that's kind of what we're going to be looking at in the next lesson. We've only got uh, two more lessons after this one about with OSPF, so we'll be taking a look at that. Uh, we know that OSPF is a link state routing protocol. Uh, but one of the things that we haven't gone into is how many different packet types uh, there are uh, to build the link state database. Uh, and I would say that from a, from a testing perspective, it's probably not uh, as important as it used to be. They used to test on different uh, packet types quite a bit uh, in, uh, in the exam, but now they don't really do it so much but uh, nonetheless it's still pretty important to understand uh, there are actually 12 different LSA types we're not going to go through all 12, 12 of them but there are several different LSA types we need to understand what the impact is of those different LSA types and who generates those types uh, how are they formatted what kind of information do they include and so on so each router is going to store uh, LSA packets uh, that information gets exchanged through link state updates and, and we can request that information through a link state request. But after those link state advertisements are exchanged, that's going to go into our link state database, which then allows us to synchronize information between the different routers. So let's we're going to talk about the different LSA types that exist in this lesson. We're also going to talk about how those... Uh, OSPF LSAs are flooded uh, periodically throughout the network. I mentioned that briefly when we were talking about the difference between distance vector and link state in one of the previous lessons, but uh, how LSAs are flooded, you know, we, we, we traditionally kind of classify OSPF as an incremental protocol, meaning that it's only going to send incremental updates, uh, and uh, but that's actually not the case. There is a uh, flooding that occurs every 30 minutes of the entire link state database just to ensure that everybody's databases are synchronized and everybody has the latest information. This is called the paranoid update uh, where all the LSAs are flooded, uh, flooded out. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how we exchange information uh, without a designated router. We, yesterday, if you guys recall, we talked about the DR and what the role of a designated router is in OSPF. Uh, we'll also talk about the exchange of information in the network with the designated router, uh, kind of a, re a refresher of what we talked about yesterday. Uh, we'll talk about when the SPF algorithm gets run, right? What we know that OSPF uses something called Dijkstra's algorithm, D-I-J-K-S-T-R-A-S, and Dijkstra's algorithm allows us to, to, to perform all of our calculations. Uh, we'll talk about the metric, right? How cost is calculated, uh, not only for intra-area routes, but also for inter-area routes, uh, routes that come from one area and move into another area. And then we'll, we'll talk about the rules, finally, about how we select between inter-area routes and intra-area routes because there is a selection process that takes place. Um, so let's get started. Lots of good information in this particular lesson here, but uh, it's, all, it's all excellent information, especially when you guys are trying to troubleshoot. Uh, you, you, were, you guys had a question yesterday about 
how should I design my topology? How should I, should we have a, a single backbone area for our data centers and, and then have uh, different areas for each of the locations? I think this chapter will help give you a better understanding of how that topology needs to be built and how the architecture needs to be built because of how information is exchanged between routers in your OSPF domain. And we'll, uh, we'll spend some time talking about that. All right, so uh, there are a couple of different router types that we've already talked about with regard to the OSPF topology, right? Number one, we have kind of just our internal routers. These are routers that are part of a OSPF area, but they're not in the backbone. They're just, they just have all of their interfaces inside of a single area. Then we also talked about the backbone routers. These are the routers that have all their interfaces inside of a single area, but that area happens to be area zero, the backbone. Uh, and then we have these other routers called ABRs, or area border routers. And an ABR is uh, any type of router that uh, has an interface, at least one interface attached to the backbone area and then has several other interfaces or, or even just a single interface attached to the non-backbone area. Uh, and then finally we have an ASBR, Autonomous System Boundary Router, and these are, these are routers that, that perform redistribution from a non-OSPF process or a non-OSPF autonomous system into, uh, into OSPF. So uh, the reason why it's important to understand those different types of routers is because those different types of routers are responsible for generating different types of LSAs. Uh, and the format of the LSA, the content of the LSA uh, will change depending on what type of router it is and, and um, you know, where that router is located, okay? And that's what we're gonna focus on and for, for a good part of this particular lesson here is all of that information. All right, you can even see there's a reference here uh, from 1 to 11 of the different LSA types. Type 1 is a router LSA, type 2 is a network LSA, type 3 is a summary LSA, 4 ASBR summary LSA, type 5 autonomous system LSA, and then there's some other types as well. Uh, there's uh, at least three different types that are related to OSPF v3, which is uh, OSPF for IPv6, uh, and then there are some that are reserved for future use and so on. So let's start by talking about a type one LSA. Uh, and I'm gonna describe these LSAs uh, based on a couple of different concepts. Number one, what is the scope of the LSA? In other words, does it get flooded through the entire autonomous system or does it stay within the area? So we'll call that either intra-area or inter-area LSA. Uh, inter-area meaning that it moves from one area to the next uh, intra-area meaning that it stays within the area itself and it does not move from one area to the next. Uh, and then I'm going to describe uh, these LSAs based on who generates them. All right? Is it generated by an ABR? Is it generated by an ASBR? Uh, is it uh, generated by an internal router? Uh, and then finally we'll talk about uh, essentially what information is included in that LSA uh, and what it's supposed to describe, all right? So starting with a type one LSA, a type one LSA is an inter, excuse me, intra area LSA, meaning that it is only gonna propagate through a single area. Uh, so if I've got uh, 100 different routers in area one, those routers are gonna be generating type one LSAs, but those, those LSAs stay within area one. You can see that kind of on the diagram here. In fact, type one and type two are intra-area LSAs. They never pass through an ABR, all right? So this would be one of the design elements that allows you to identify a benefit of having a multi-area design is that these type one and type two LSAs never leave the area. Uh, so having a smaller backbone, for example, could, could produce potentially less traffic um, uh, but we'll talk more about that as we kind of go through this lesson here and we kind of uh, get a better understanding of what these LSA types represent. 
So who generates a type 1 LSA? Uh, well, everybody. Every single router in OSPF generates a type 1 LSA. Uh, that type 1 LSA describes its local links. All right. It's called a, a net, well, it's called a router LSA because it's generated by every router. Uh, and it describes the links that are attached to that particular router. So think of this as kind of like the most fundamental LSA because it uh, essentially allows me to identify to everybody else the networks that I'm attached to, all right? My connected routes that are part of the OSPF process, all right? So type 1 LSAs only propagate within the area. They're never passed beyond the area. They never go through an area border router. Uh, there is a 20 byte LSA header uh, and uh, one of the fields within that LSA header is something called a link state ID uh, and we'll see this as we kind of analyze our link state database. There's a, a uh, discovery lab that we're going uh, to do to kind of analyze the link state database and the link state ID of this type 1 LSA is the actual router ID of the router that's generating the particular LSA type. So when we when we investigate our database, we take a look at our database, it's easy for us to identify the source of this LSA because the router ID is the link state ID for the LSA. Uh, that might not make 100% uh, sense right now. More fire trucks. Uh, I don't know, you guys can't probably hear the sirens, but um, that might not make sense right now uh, with regard to the, uh, you know, how it's referenced in the database. Uh, but we're going to buttress this discussion by going through a discovery. And of course, I'm going to show you guys all of these things that I'm going to be talking about uh, when we go take a look at the, the, the discovery lab and, and start analyzing a database and taking a look at a database. The next type of LSA, uh, a very common type of LSA as well, of course, type 1 LSAs are uh, they always exist. There's no, there's no scenario where you're never going to see a type 1 LSA in an OSPF domain. Whether you have a single area design or whether you have a multiple multi-area design, type 1 LSAs are always going to exist. Uh, the next type of LSA that we see is a type 2. Type 2 LSAs are generated by designated routers in our network. All right, A DR, we talked about this yesterday in the previous lesson. Uh, is a router that is essentially managing a multi-access network, for lack of a better term. It becomes the chief of that network, uh, and all of the information exchange occurs through the designated router within that multi-access network. So the only uh, type of router that's going to generate a Type 2 LSA is a designated router. All right? Uh, the... This is called a network LSA because it actually describes the network that the DR is managing, right? What is the IP address? What is the subnet mask? And then what are the other routers that are attached to this multi-access network that I'm supposed to be the chief of and that I'm supposed to be responsible for? All right. These are also intra-area LSAs. They're not flooded throughout the, uh, throughout the autonomous system. Uh, they stay within the area. They never leave the area uh, as a Type 2 LSA. We'll talk about what Type 3s are in a minute, but because Type 3s really play a huge role in OSPF as well. Uh, these network link advertisements, they're flooded within the area, and the link state ID in this case is the actual physical IP address of the designated router uh, on the segment that the DR is managing right, on the actual physical segment that the DR is managing. Then we have type 3 LSAs, and I, I believe I mentioned it, but type 2 LSAs are intra-area. They stay within the area. Then we have a type 3 LSA, and this is really one of the more critical LSA types uh, that exist in OSPF. They're called summary LSAs. They're actually called summary LSAs for a reason um, because they're generated by ABRs. Uh, and they're supposed to represent uh, an actual summary of type 1s uh, that move from, from area to area. So essentially, in the case of OSPF, type 1 LSAs become 
type 3 LSAs. All right, so as, as all of my type 1 LSAs get constructed and get advertised throughout Area 1, as those LSAs pass through the ABR and move into Area 0, they, they, they get converted from type 1 to type 3. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention, type 1 is going to be your O routes. In your, in your, when I do a show IP route OSPF, uh, any, any route that has a code of O next to it, that's going to be my type 1 LSA. Any route that has a code of OIA next to it, that's going to represent my type 3 LSAs. All right. There's only one router that can generate type 3 LSAs, and that's the area border router. Now, why, why do you suppose they're called summary LSAs? Any ideas? Because they are supposed to represent summaries, right? Uh, a type 3 LSA, uh, even though it doesn't happen by default, uh, can be configured to be a representative of a summary of all my type 1 LSAs. So, uh, by default, if I have a thousand type 1 LSAs in area 1, then I'm going to have a thousand type 3 LSAs that pass through into area 0 from area 1. Uh, and conversely, if I have a thousand type 1 LSAs in area 0, those are going to be passed through router 2 as a thousand type 3 LSAs into area 1. So essentially, by default, uh, type 1s just simply get converted to type 3s, and then they get sent back and forth between the two different areas. So summarization does not occur by default. Uh, there's no actual way to make OSPF summarize by default, uh, but you can certainly configure summaries, and we'll see that in one of the final lessons of this particular module, where we get to see how summarization is configured and, and set up in, in, inside of OSPF. By the way, how's my audio? Is it okay? Yes, yeah, good. Okay, good. All right. I don't want the recordings to be messed up, too, so... I think there was a bunch of static because it was um, the microphone was sitting right next to the fan on my computer and I think it was blowing into the fan. But All right, so type 3 LSAs or summary LSAs, uh, you, have to actually, you actually have to manually configure those summaries uh, and the link state ID of a type 3 LSA is the actual destination network number, meaning the actual summary uh, that you've created. Uh, all of these things, by the way, I'm going to point out and show you guys, and we're going to correlate uh, what we're looking at in a database to what we actually have in our topology diagram so that you guys will have an understanding of how do I analyze a link state database? How can I tell if information is being propagated appropriately? You know, what, what steps can I take to troubleshoot the link state database if, if uh, it appears that things are not listed or things are not shown in the database. Then we have our type 4 LSAs. Now the interesting thing about a type 4 LSA, number one, those are also only generated by area border routers. Uh, nobody else within an autonomous system will generate a type 4 LSA. But type 4 LSAs will never exist unless you have type 5 LSAs. So they're actually kind of paired together. It's called an ASBR summary LSA. All right. Uh, it's a little confusing. So I'm going to table the discussion of the type 4 LSA, and we're going to go into talking about the type 5 LSA first, and then I'll go back to the type 4 LSA. Uh, a type 5 LSA, these are generated by an ASBR that's attached to a normal area. There's also a type 7. Uh, type 5 LSAs and Type 7 LSAs are essentially the same thing. Uh, they're, they're LSAs that describe external routes, uh, routes that are being sent in by an ASBR. So in this case, Router 3 is an autonomous system boundary router. Uh, it's running some sort of external routing process. Could be EIGRP, could be BGP, uh, could be some static routes, it could be some connected routes. But we're doing redistribution into OSPF from this router, which makes it an autonomous system boundary router. 
those routes are being sent into OSPF as type 5 LSAs. So a type 5 LSA is basically an LSA that describes external destinations to the autonomous system. Uh, you also notice that these are inter-area LSAs, meaning they get flooded throughout the entire autonomous system. Assuming we don't have any special area types, we'll talk about special area types a little bit later on. But these get flooded throughout the entire autonomous system and they remain type 5s uh, as they move from one area to the next. So they start as type 5s in area 1, which is where the ASBR is attached, and they stay type 5s as they move into the backbone. And if the backbone has other areas attached, those LSAs will propagate through those areas as well. Any type of inter-area LSA is not going to stop just at the backbone. It gets propagated through the backbone to the other areas as well. All right. The link state ID in this particular case is the actual external network number, the prefix that we're actually getting from the external routing process. Uh, now, let's talk about that type 4 LSA. Type 5 LSAs describe reachability information to the external networks that are being redistributed into OSPF. Type 4 LSAs describe the originator of those Type 5 LSAs. So a Type 4 LSA is essentially a link state advertisement that allows me to identify who the ASBR is and how to reach the ASBR and so on. And then the Type 5 LSAs describe the routes that are being injected by the ASBR. All of this will make a lot more sense as we look at our topology and we kind of compare our discussion that we're going through now to a real-time topology where we're actually looking at the database and I can kind of point out, okay, this is where this route's coming from, this is where this route's coming from, that's why this is a Type 2, that's why this is a Type 3, and so on. All right, so the ASBR uh, summary link advertisement uh, allows us to identify to the rest of the OSPF domain how to get to the ASBR. The link state ID for this is the router ID of the actual ASBR. All right, uh, those are the primary ones. Uh, I would say a type 7 would probably be a close second on the list to the primary ones, even though type 7 isn't listed individually in this particular slide, type 7 LSAs are a very important LSA type as well. Uh, they're essentially equivalent to a type 5, but it's with an ASBR that's attached to a special area, uh, either a not so stubby area or a totally not so stubby area. And in the next lesson, we'll get into special area types and talk about the difference there and that's going to be a key design element for what you guys are doing in your enterprise as well. Um, it's always recommended to use special area types in OSPF to make it a little bit more efficient and and to reduce the amount of information exchange that has to take place within OSPF and reduce the size of our databases and so on. All right so we do have a type 6 LSA uh, that's used for multicast uh, I've actually never seen a Type 6 LSA in production, believe it or not. Uh, I've seen it in lab environments, but I haven't seen it in a production environment because it's just not very common. Uh, so you're not going to see Type 6 too often. You're certainly not going to be tested on Type 6. Type 7, you'll definitely see that. Uh, and when we get into our discussion of special area types, the Type 7 will make a little bit more sense. Uh, type 8 and Type 9, these are used in OSPF. Uh, one is for link local addressing. So we do have that special address type in IPv6 uh, that we don't have in IPv4, which is the link local addresses. So there has to be a way of transporting information about link local addresses within a broadcast domain, and a Type 8 LSA allows us to do that. Uh, and then finally, our Type 9 LSA, which is our intra-area prefix LSAs, uh, very similar to a Type 3 uh, in that it allows us to identify prefixes that are moving from one area to the next, but it is slightly different. We'll take a look at those, both of those LSA types when we get into OSPF v3 and we start to take a look at OSPF for IPv6 configurations. All right, uh, and then type 10 and type 11 are just generic opaque LSAs. 
opaque meaning, you know, literally from the origin of the word, uh, they're not really very well defined. Uh, they're actually kind of generic and they're used for, uh, they're, well, potentially going to be used for future expansion of OSPF and, and identifying, um, you know, maybe some new enhancements or new features in, in OSPF. All right. So type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5, and type 7 are really the ones that you, you need to be well versed in, particularly for the exam. Uh, but we will take a look at type 8 and type 9 a little bit later on as well. All right. Uh, they used to test on this quite a bit. Maybe not so much today. Uh, you know, is it intra-area, is it inter-area, and so on. One of the things that I did not mention... Uh, which I should have, I suppose. A type 3 LSA I did mention is an OIA route in your routing table, but a type 5 is either an OE1 or an OE2 route. Uh, external type 1 or external type 2. Uh, we'll get into that when we get into um, one of the future lessons here for OSBF. And then if you have a type 7, that's the type of route that's going to show up as an ON1 or an ON2 in the topology. Uh, N stands for not so stubby, uh, and uh, both of the external routes are represented with either an E or an N. So an ON1 route and an ON2 route, those are external routes in OSPF as well. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get uh, going on our next discovery, uh, discovery number 10. Uh, where in this particular case, we're actually going to take a look at the Link State database. We have uh, Kind of a standard OSPF design, our backbone area, uh, R1 is, is our ABR that connects area one and area two. So it's very similar to the original topology that we had in discovery number nine. But in this particular case, we're adding an external set of routes uh, that are being redistributed uh, into OSPF through router three. So R3 is acting as uh, an ASBR in this particular case. Uh, and um, We'll just take a look at the database. You know, from, from the topology diagram, uh, any thoughts on potentially what types, I'm just curious if you guys know, I mean, uh, uh, we're gonna go through this, but what types of LSAs I might see in area zero? Any ideas? Well, you're definitely gonna see one and two. There's no doubt about that. One, two and four, right? You'll see four. Yep, you'll see four as well. Uh, because of the ASBR in area two, type fours are going to be generated in area zero and area one. What else? Type five also, right. Type five, because we're going to have routes coming from our ASBR, they're going to inject it as type five and they're going to propagate through the network as type five. And of course, type three, right? Type 3 are routes that are coming from other areas. So in area 0, we'll see type 1, we'll see type 2, type 3, type 4, and type 5. All right. Uh, in area 2, pretty much the same thing. Because this is an Ethernet link, so there is going to be a DR, BDR election there, which means that there's going to be type 2s. Of course, there's always type 1s. Those always exist. Uh, there'll be type 3s from other areas. Uh, and there'll be type fives coming in from R3. The only one that's going to be missing from area two is what? Any thoughts? Type fours. We will not see a type four in area two uh, because type fours are only generated by the ABR into the other areas that doesn't have the ASBR attached. Uh, everybody within area two can simply reach the ASBR by using the type one LSAs that that uh, demonstrate the, the ASBR or or uh, facilitate communication to the ASBR. So we would not see type fours in area two, uh, and then in area one, depending on how this serial link is configured, because we know that we can make this point to point. We know that we can make this uh, point, uh, uh, excuse me, broadcast or non-broadcast. So depending on how that serial link and that frame relay network is configured, will determine as to what types of LSAs I'll see in there. I certainly see type ones. There's no doubt about that. May or may not see type twos, depending on how the serial link is provisioned. 
Uh, we'll definitely see type threes. We'll definitely see type fours, and we'll definitely see type fives. Um, so that's that's kind of uh, the extent of what you would have to be able to do uh, with um, a topology in in the on the route exam. Uh, they might give you a diagram or might give you a you know some sort of topology and say, okay, identify what types of LSAs you might see. So let me pause uh, the video real quick. We'll get the discovery loaded, and then we'll um, go into this discovery and kind of analyze the database in a lot more detail. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get into this discovery, discovery number 10. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we've got the discovery loaded up. We've got R1 is an ABR in our topology. Uh, so it's going to have type 1 LSAs uh, basically representing every route in... Uh, in the network, all right, uh, and uh, then we have type 2 uh, LSAs, which are probably going to be generated in area 0, and they're certainly going to be generated in uh, area 2 as well, because even though it looks like a WAN connection, it's really just an Ethernet cable that's connected between the two routers. Uh, and then finally in area 1, the uh, serial link allows us to describe, obviously, the frame relay link, and we'll have to go back and look at and see how that frame relay, how that frame relay link is provisioned, what is the OSPF network type, and so on. So that's what we're going to be doing in this uh, in this topology is just kind of taking a look at the database and correlating it to what we just learned in uh, in the you know about OSPF and database replication and whatnot. So that's what our goal is in this particular exercise. All right, so the first thing is, let's go ahead and take a look at the routing table on router four. Router four is uh, in the backbone area. It is a backbone router. I would expect to see OIA routes, definitely. I would expect to see OIA routes coming from area one and area two. And I would also expect to see OE, OE uh, two routes coming from our external network over here, this bright pink color here. We've got a 10.0.0.0 slash 16 network that's being redistributed into OSPF, uh, probably by router three. Uh, the diagram doesn't really depict the, the, the demarcation point here very well, but I'm guessing router three is gonna be our, the router that's actually doing the redistribution. So let's go into router number four and take a look at the routing table. Show. IP route OSPF, and uh, at, we're missing our external routes. Hmm, okay, might have to go back and fix that. Uh, yeah, we should be seeing this OE2 route here. So let me take a look and see what's going on on router number three real quick. Do, do, do. Router three, show run section OSPF. We should see some redistribution. Yep, redistributing EIGRP 100 subnets. Um, show IP EIGRP neighbors. All right, we don't have neighbors for router three. So I am guessing that the external router probably doesn't have a configuration. Let me go into that external router here. Yep. So we're missing our config on our external router. Let me drop that in real quick. Uh, let's see, project files, Dynamips, configs, uh, external startup. Do, do, do. So we should get an adjacency. There we go. So we're running EIGRP externally. Uh, and then in router number three, we're redistributing EIGRP into OSPF. Uh, and that's what makes this router our ASBR. So now if I go back to router four and I take a look at that database, there we go. That's better. All right, so we're seeing an OE2 route. We'll talk about the difference between OE1 and OE2 a little bit later on. 
Uh, there's really only one significant difference, and that's how the metric is handled as the route propagates through OSPF. Um, but right now it's coming in as an OSPF external type 2 route. Which is basically my type 5 route, right? That's my type 5 LSA. Uh, and then we have this type 3 route here 172.16.12 and this type 3 route here 172.16.13 and that corresponds to what I would expect to see this is the 12 link right here this is the 13 link right here let's move this over here so we have we can see that that's the 13 link right here um, now we should also be seeing the 2 subnet in our routing database and that should be coming in as an OIA as well. Yep, there it is. Uh, now let's see, in the book they have that coming in as a slash 24. Uh, do you guys recall why it's not coming in as a slash 24 in our particular case? Any ideas? Uh, because it's a loopback. And uh, as a loopback, I need to change the network type of that loopback in order for it to be advertised as a with the prefix. Uh, right now, OSPF is assuming that's a loopback, and the network type is loopback in this case. So let me go over to router two, config t interface loopback zero IP OSPF network type. Uh, let's do point two point. All right. Now, if I come back over to router four, and I take a look at the routing table. Um, Let's see, there we go. Uh, now it's coming in as a prefix. Uh, remember, OSPF, when it identifies the network as a loopback, it just sends it in as a host route, regardless of whatever's configured on the interface. All right, so now we've got our routing table. Uh, the last thing that I'm seeing here is the 1.1 subnet. Uh, and in this case, again, it's, it should be coming in as a 1.0 that one network is a loop back on router one. So I'm going to have to do the same thing on router one, go into router one and make sure that this is uh, configured as a, uh, as the loop back is configured with an OSPF network type point to point. If I do a show IP OSPF interface loop back zero, you can see it's actually recognizing it as a network type of loop back. So it's going to send it in as a host route. So config T interface loop back zero, uh, IP OSPF network point to point. All right. All right. Now we got everything kind of cleaned up a little bit. Uh, we should see that coming in as a slash 24. Uh, now it is an O route, which means it's coming in. It's a it, it's an intra area route, uh, specifically a type one LSA that's coming in from um, router one. Uh, router one is participating in area zero, just like router four is. So it's an internal route to area zero. Uh, whereas these are external routes to area zero, and this is an external route to area zero right here. All right. All righty. So if we take a look at the actual database, we can now start to kind of dive into the database. I can reference all those concepts that I was referencing or talking about with you guys previously. You know, what is the link state ID and so on. So let's go into the database. Now there's a couple of ways that you can analyze an OSPF database. Uh, if you guys recall from an EIGRP perspective, uh, basically the equivalent was a show IP EIGRP topology. Right now, obviously, we're not going to get anything on this router for that. But what I'm trying to correlate here is that what we're looking at is essentially everything that I'm learning. Right. This is the, the second of the three data structures that we typically see with a dynamic protocol. One is the neighbor table. The second is the, the topology database. And the third is the routing table. We already looked at the routing table, and we can already assume that we have neighbors, so we don't really need to look at the neighbor table. Show IP OSPF database. Now, uh, I want to point out something here real quick before we kind of get into the, into the details. 
when I run the command show IP OSPF database, I am looking at essentially a summary of this OSPF database. I'm not looking at the individual details of the database. Because uh, if you think about it, what I, what I typically would expect to see when I'm looking at a, a topology database is routing information, right? And routing information typically is going to include things like metrics for networks. Uh, it's going to include advertising router. It's going to include next hop and so on. Uh, but as you can see from this output here, that's not what we're seeing at all. Uh, we don't see actually any reference to any prefixes in this particular output. And that's because we're not looking at the actual details of the link state advertisements themselves. We're looking at a summary of the database. This is the, the same type of information that would be exchanged between routers during the uh, process of forming an adjacency. Uh, you know, we talked about the, the X start state and then finally going to the exchange state. Well, that's essentially what we would be sending back and forth in this particular case, is this summary of our database. Uh, but there are some things that we should be able to recognize. For number one, router link states. These are my type one LSAs in area zero. So just by understanding that I ran this command on area zero automatically tells me and this is something that they, they tend to do on the exam, this automatically tells me that router four is in area zero because there's no way that router four would ever see any router link states in area zero if it wasn't a member of area zero. Does that make sense? So you can infer a lot of information from uh, uh, your understanding of how the database is constructed and how link state advertisements are propagated throughout the autonomous system. You can kind of infer a couple of different things about the router itself based on the command that you run on that particular router. So this is a uh, router four with a router ID of 4.4.4.4, .4 process ID of one, and the router link states are my type one LSAs. The link state ID in this particular case, all right, is the advertising router. So this also tells me that there are two routers in the backbone in this particular area, router one, and router four. Uh, and uh, of course, if I had other routers in the backbone, I would see additional information about those routers as well. So the link ID. And, and that's. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes. And that's, they, only need, they only need one interface in that area zero to qualify for that link. Correct. Correct. Which is actually the case for both routers, isn't it? Router four only has one interface in the area. Uh, and uh, router one only has one interface in the area. Actually, router one has technically two because it's loopback is also part of area zero. But yes, uh, router one only has one physical interface participating in area zero. Same with router four. It only has one physical interface participating in area zero. Okay. Uh, so let's go in uh, to a little bit more detail. We'll talk about what the age column represents and what the sequence number represents. Uh, the age uh, is a way for us to identify when that advertisement was flooded. And uh, eventually it will synchronize because after 30 minutes, um, we're going to do a, a repropagation of all of our LSAs throughout the autonomous system. And that's that part of that uh, paranoid update that we're going to see. Uh, the sequence number allows us to identify uh, how many times this particular advertisement has been updated. Uh, sequence numbers always start with this number right here, uh, hex 8000001. Uh, and every time I get an update about that particular link state entry, this number will increment by one. So I've received at least two updates for this particular entry. I've received one update for this entry. And for the rest of them, these are the original updates that went out describing that network information. Okay. The last thing that uh, link count is uh, what's important in this particular case because really, and we're going to dive into these in, in more detail in a little bit, but really that's what this advertisement includes. 
it includes an advertisement of two different networks. Well, that makes sense from Router 1's perspective, doesn't it? Because Router 1 actually has two, two networks that are participating in Area 0. And Router 4 only has one network that's participating in Area 0. Uh, we'll, I'll show you guys how we can kind of see what the link information is, because that's the actual routing information that's being advertised by the router. We have to drill down into the database to be able to see that information. But before we get uh, into that, let's talk about some of the other LSAs. Netlink state LSAs, type twos. All right. Now I can also identify who a DR is within, a, within an area by looking at the advertising router for this type two LSA. So I know by uh, because the advertising router is 4.4.4.4, that for that particular network segment, router four is the designated router because DRs are the only routers that generate type two LSAs. All right. Um, and uh, we'll again, go into the detail of what that looks like. We're not really seeing any detail. The, the actual link ID is the physical address of the of the uh, router interface that's that's managing that multi-axis network so this is the actual address that it's participating in that multi-axis network uh, that allows this router to be uh, the dr for that particular segment okay summary netlink states these are my type 3 lsa's uh, i can see that the advertising router in every case is router 1 so that tells me that router 1 is an abr because the only type of router that's ever going to generate a summary netlink state is an ABR. And then we can also see the link ID as the actual network prefix for each of the networks that are being advertised. Well, it kind of makes sense here. 12 is the, the link between the, the frame relay connection. So that's going to come in as a type 3. The 13 is the WAN connection in area 2, so that's going to come in as a type 13, I mean a type 3. And then finally this loop back up here is going to come in as a type 3 into the, into the database uh, on the back end. So that's why we see those three entries for each of those networks, because those are the summaries. Uh, then the next thing we see is what we call a summary ASB link state. These are my type 4 LSAs, and then finally my type 5 LSAs. It's kind of interesting that this is the only one where they actually tell you it's a type 5. Uh, would have been kind of nice if they would have just done that with all of them. Uh, but this is my type 4 LSA. All right. The advertising router is the ABR, but a type 4 LSA describes reachability information to the ASBR. That's the router ID of our ASBR, which is router 3. So a type 4 LSA allows me to identify reachability information to an ASBR. And so I can actually tell just by my understanding of how the database is constructed and just by my understanding of, of what these numbers represent, I can kind of start to get a visual uh, idea of what the actual network looks like. I know what my ABRs are, I know what my backbone routers are, I know what my uh, ASBR is, uh, and so on. So it's actually pretty useful, uh, just having that solid understanding of, of how databases are constructed. Type 5 LSA, this is going to be advertised or generated by the ASBR, so there's another way I can tell who the ASBR is. And the a link ID is the actual network prefix that's being sent into OSPF from another routing process. All right, so that's our, those are our LSA types. Now, what if I wanna drill down and see the actual detail? Uh, I wanna see the actual routing information that's tied to say these links here or this information here or whatever. Uh, that's where you have to actually use the sub command. So if I do a show IP OSPF database question mark, you can see that it, there's a whole bunch of options that I have in analyzing the database. Uh, I can look at the external link states, internal LSAs, network link states, opaque area LSAs, uh, opaque link state LSAs, that's our link local stuff. 
We're not running any IPv6 in this topology, so that won't help us. But the router link states, summaries, and so on. So I can drill down into um, the database by simply specifying what LSA types I want to see. And now I'm taking a look at the specific details of my type 1 LSAs because type 1 LSAs are router LSAs. So this is where you start to see the information that actually kind of makes sense. You know, the information that would actually be useful for determining paths and metrics and everything else because we can actually see that information. Again, this is a router link, which means it's a type 1 LSA. The link state ID and the advertising router are the same because in this case, the link state ID represents who's originating this LSA type. Uh, uh, so I can tell that router one is part of area zero because these are type one LSAs within area zero. And the only way for router one to generate type one LSAs is if it's a member of the area. All right. And we see some of the other stuff that we saw in the summary which is the sequence number, the checksum, and so on. Uh, but then we can also see that we're identifying router one as, as an area border router. Uh, and it's sending information about two different links into the topology. Uh, and of course, it would be the links that we would expect to see. The loopback interface that's on the router. So that's the prefix. This is the subnet mask. This is the metric. We haven't talked about the actual uh, how OSPF calculates metrics. We're going to do that a little bit later in this lesson, but that metric makes perfect sense uh, because of the formula that's used for calculating the metric. So this is where we're actually seeing the link state information. Who is this network attached to? What does the network look like? What is its subnet mask? What is its uh, metric and so on? Local metric, not the metric for me to reach that destination, but the metric for the actual link itself. All right, OSPF, remember, is a link state routing protocol. So it's going to have a complete picture of the topology. It's going to know who's connected to whom uh, and how all that information is relatable. All right. Uh, and then we have our transit network as well. Transit network is just simply a broadcast domain. Uh, and in this particular case, we're seeing because it is a transit network, a broadcast domain, we do see a reference to the DR and BDR for that network. We see the metric for that network and so on. Uh, and um, that's it, right? So these are the two links that are being advertised by router one. And then we have our router four LSA, which also is a transit network. Uh, and we see the um, uh, designated router, uh, the IP address of, that, of my interface that's participating in that network, and then the metric for that network as well, all right? So you can do all kinds of things with this. Uh, you can obviously kind of understand or build an, uh, you know, a representation of what the network looks like and so on. Uh, we can also do a command called uh, router self-originate, where I can actually say, OK, I just want to see the, the networks that I'm responsible for originating within the area. Uh, so by adding that self-originate command, we're able to see uh, the, the prefixes that I'm responsible for, all right? So we're going to take a look at some of the other ones as well. Uh, in the book, they have you kind of going through and analyzing the database on each router. So if I come into router number two, for example, one of the things that you should see, show IP OSPF database, uh, is a similar database, not exactly the same, because obviously router two is participating in a different area, than router one or router four, but we should see similar information. All right, we see a router link state here for area one. That tells me that router two is in area one because otherwise I wouldn't see type one LSAs on router two. And we have essentially two different routers that are participating in that area, router one and router two. Router one, of course, being the ABR, it's gonna be sending in two different links. Uh, this is interesting, the link count for router two is three. But if you look at the topology diagram, router two only has two networks. It's got the loopback network and it's got the frame relay network. So why would I be generating three different links for that particular network? Well, let me show you real quick. 
if I do a show IP OSPF database router, you can see that uh, sure enough on from router one we're we're seeing what we would expect to see. There's two links. Uh, there is uh, this point-to-point -point link that interconnects the two devices. That's the 12 subnet. Uh, this is the address on router one that's participating in that 12 subnet. This is the metric for that for that network. Uh, and then we see this stub network configuration, right? This is the actual LAN that uh, represents this network here, all right? Remember, these are the type 1 LSAs that exist within area 1. So the loopback interface on router 1 is not in area 1, it's in area 0. And obviously the physical interface on area 1, excuse me, on router 1 in area 0 is going to be in area 0 as well. So we're actually seeing two different entries for the same type of network. And this just has to do with the fact that it's an, that it's an NBMA network. And OSPF kind of treats those NBMA networks a little bit differently than it does other types of networks. So even though we only actually technically have one network that Router 1 is attached to that's part of Area 1, uh, it shows up as two different link state advertisements because of the type of network it is. In this case, a point-to-point -point network um, because we configured on the router interface, we configured the network type as point-to-point. -point. So uh, we see, that's why we see two entries there when you would expect to only see one. And then on uh, router number two, uh, uh, we see three different entries. But again, we, you know, this is our standard entry for the broadcast network, the, the loopback 2.0 with a mask of slash 24 and a metric of one. But then I also have the same concept here, stub network versus point to point. So the point, this, this particular entry represents the actual physical address that the router is using to participate in that network. And then the one below it represents the actual network prefix and subnet mask and so on. All right. So uh, if we go back to our diagram here, I would expect to see type ones for sure uh, because this is a point-to-point -point serial link I should not see type twos in this particular case I should see type threes and I should see type fours and I should see type fives so let's take a look at that and see if that's actually the case show IP OSPF database oops And there's our type 1s, there's our type 3s. We don't have any Netlink state LSAs. Remember, Netlink state LSAs are type 2s. Uh, because that was a point-to-point -point serial link, there is no DRBDR election. Remember, point to anything, no DRBDR election. So we don't see our Netlink states uh, in, in this particular case. So these are my type 3s, these are my type 4s, these are my type 5s. Exactly what I would expect to see on router 2. All right. Uh, now, if I go to router one, router one's kind of an interesting router. So let's go into router one. Uh, by the way, what, based on the topology diagram, what types of entries should I see in router one's database? Any ideas? I know I'm going to see type ones, right? Would I possibly see a type 2? Yeah. Would I see a type 3? Yeah. No. I would not. How come I won't see any type 3s on router 1? Summary. It is the ABR. It's a member of all areas. So, remember, summary LSAs move from one area to the other. Uh, but R1 is the one that's actually generating the type 3s. So I'm not going to see type 3s specific to the areas in router 1. Uh, let's go take a look at router 1's database real quick. All right. Show, uh, let's see, enable, show IP OSPF database. So I do see the summaries, but I'm the advertising router in every case, right? 
Um, I, uh, as, as expected, I would see router link states. Uh, and that breaks it down by area, by the way. So it doesn't just say, these are all the router link states for every area. It breaks it down by area. So if I keep scrolling here, you'll see area one, and then you'll see all the LSAs for area two and so on. All right, so essentially, router one has everything, has everything, uh, which makes sense because router one is participating in every domain. It's participating in every area uh, and it's also originating a lot of these type uh, LSA types as well. So uh, these are the type ones that it's getting from router area zero. Uh, this is the type twos that it's getting from area zero. These are the type threes, even though I'm not technically receiving those type threes, I'm generating those type threes. Does that make sense? Uh, these are summary net link states that are being advertised by me into the other areas. So, uh, you know, they do exist, but they're not being learned from another router. These are my type four LSAs for area zero, which I'd expect to see because the uh, ASBR is in area two. So I should be generating type fours in area zero and type fours in area one. All right. Uh, this is the type ones in area one. Uh, we don't have any, we don't have a DR or BDR in area one. So we don't have any Netlink state LSAs, but we do have summaries. Uh, and we have type fours in area one. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, what's missing in area one as well as area zero. What we're missing is type five LSAs. All right, but the thing about this router being that it's the ABR, it doesn't store the type five LSAs. It's not, number one, it's not originating the type five LSAs. Uh, and it doesn't store those type five LSAs because it is a member of the local area which we're going to get those routes from from uh, type ones. Uh, let's take a look here. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So we see the type fives here, but that's because that's the area that the type fives are coming in from. All right, so this 10 network, but I don't see the type fives listed in area uh, zero or area one. And that's because uh, I'm just simply propagating those type five routes into those areas. If I went to the routers in those areas, like router four and router two, I would see the type fives in that particular case. So I only need to have the type fives in router one time. Why would I have to have the type fives listed multiple times in the same database? Uh, they only have to exist one time and they're gonna exist based on the area that they originated from. In this particular case, area two. All right, so, uh, it makes sense. Say for example, let's take a look at our summary net link state LSAs, which are my type three LSAs for area two. I've got 12, I've got 14, I've got one and I've got two. Well, if I go look at my topology diagram, area two is down here. What would be summaries in this area from the other areas? The one network, the 14 network, the 12 network and the two network. Uh, I think that's all of them. Do, do, do. Yep, uh, 12 network, 14 network, one network, and the two network. Makes perfect sense. All right, so just by understanding the different LSA types and, and having a good understanding of, of you know, who generates what types of LSAs and, and, and where those LSAs propagate, that's a really important concept in, in understanding how to verify and troubleshoot this database. So let's go through some of these slides. We've already done many of these slides here. So we'll kind of scroll through here. There's my type one LSAs, my router LSAs. That's when we drilled down into the router database and we took a look at those. Uh, then we're doing the self-originate. We did that uh, to identify what LSAs I was generating. Uh, then we went into router number two. We took a look at the database in router number two kind of compared it to the topology diagram to make sure that uh, we recognize what's actually being shown there. We did the same thing in router number one, all right? So 
Type 2 LSAs, those are generated for what we call a transit broadcast network or a non-broadcast multi-axis network within a particular area. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, Type 2 LSAs represent essentially the broadcast domain or the multi-axis network that the DR is responsible for managing. Uh, so the only type of router that generates these Type 2 LSAs is a DR. Uh, and let's take a look at what those LSAs look like. Uh, let's investigate on, uh, in this case, on router number four. Uh, router four, we've already identified as our DR in this network. If I do a show IP OSPF neighbor, I can see that I have a neighbor relationship with router one. All right. But router one is the BDR, which means I must be the DR. But if I do a quick show IP OSPF interface, uh, Ethernet 1.0, I can see that the designated router is, in fact, router four, which is me. Okay. So let's take a look at the database, show IP OSPF database. And sure enough, we see the Netlink state LSAs. If I do a show IP OSPF database question mark, network is what's going to allow me to drill down into that network LSA. Now remember, the scope of this link state advertisement is it's generated by the DR within the area, and it propagates up to the ABR, but it doesn't go beyond the ABR. Uh, so this is an intra-area intra LSA, and it doesn't cross the, uh, the, the boundary router. All right. In fact, it doesn't even really describe a route specifically. Let's take a look at the details and see what it actually describes in the actual advertisement. So we're going to add our network command to our database command to drill down into the type 2 LSAs. And you take a look at it. This is the link state ID is the actual physical address of the DR. This is the advertising router, which is the router ID of the DR. Uh, we've had one update, uh, and this is the subnet mask for that particular network. All right, so I know what my address is in participating in that subnet. I also know what the subnet mask is for that network, and then I also know who are the other routers that are attached to that broadcast domain that the DR is responsible for managing. So if I had four or five or six or seven different routers attached to this broadcast domain, every one of them would be listed. Notice there's no metric here. There's no quote unquote network ID. There is a prefix. So we can kind of infer what the network ID is based on our participation in the network, uh, 172.16.14.0 in this case. But uh, overall, we're not really describing a network. We're describing who's attached to the broadcast domain that the DR is responsible for managing. All right. So it, uh, that's what we're seeing in this content. Uh, the type two LSA describes that network segment. It gives us the DR address. It gives us the subnet mask that's used for that particular segment. It gives us all the routers that are attached to that segment. Uh, and that allows us to kind of create this picture of that multi-access segment, uh, which we can't see from just a type one LSA. All right. So the next type of LSA that we talk about is our summary LSA, which is uh, a type three LSA. And uh, actually there's our verification, excuse me, from our type two LSA. Uh, this is where we drilled down into it and took a look at it. Uh, the next one we have is our Type 3 LSA, which is only generated by an ABR. Uh, we know that Type 1s and Type 2s uh, are intra-area LSAs, and they stop at the area border router. But other routers in the network still need to know about those networks. So those get converted to Type 3s, and then the Type 3s get flooded throughout the autonomous system as a Type 3. All right, what we call a summary LSA. Now... The reason it's called a summary LSA is because it is actually supposed to be a summary of all of those routes, but by default, OSPF does not do automatic summarization, even if they're contiguous networks. 
uh, and it doesn't summarize to classful boundaries and so on. Later on, we're going to learn in a future lesson how do we configure summaries within OSPF. We'll take a look at that. Um, but for the most part, uh, summary LSAs are representative of all the, the type 1s and the type 2s that are being generated within the area that the ABR is attached to. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> as a uh, best practice, obviously, in order to reduce the size of our databases and reduce the size of our topology, uh, also to reduce the impact of topology changes, we're going to go ahead and do manual summarization. We can, there's two routers you can summarize on in OSPF. You can summarize on a, uh, an ABR and you can summarize on an ASBR. Uh, we'll take a look at what that looks like a little bit later on. So let's go into router number four. We'll take a look at the uh, summary summaries that are being received on router number four. Show IP OSPF database. So we see the summary net link states here, network 12, network 13, and network 2. And obviously if I go ahead and put in summary, I can see the details for those particular routes. There's the mask. This is the advertising router, so that's the ABR. This is the metric for the network. And then this is the actual link state ID. Is the, uh, the link state ID in this case is the actual summary route. Uh, and uh, in this specific example, it's just representative of the network that exists over in, in that uh, area one. All right. Uh, here we see another one. This is the 13 subnet slash 30 prefix metric of 10 uh, and then this is the summary of that network which is actually technically not a summary uh, and then finally the two network which is the one that was coming in from the loop back on router number two uh, this is the prefix this is the metric and so on okay all right Hopefully this is all making sense, guys. You're kind of picking this up. It's a lot of information to digest. Uh, it took me a while myself to really become well-versed in the concept of these advertisements and, and, and how these that advertisements are sent throughout the network. Uh, I think you gotta, I think you got to lab it all up and, and you'll multiple times. Right. I, I completely yeah. agree. Yep. I completely agree. It's uh, it's really important to uh, to kind of go through the process and and do what we're basically doing in this case. Just take your topology diagram and compare it to what you're seeing in the database, and then kind of correlate all of these discussions in that in that uh, in that process. So I would actually encourage you guys to do that in your next lab um, that we're going to be doing uh, soon. Uh, in your next lab. Take a look at that and, you know, take a look at that process and see if you can kind of, you know, solidify your knowledge by doing the same kind of comparisons that I'm doing in this particular case. All right. Um, you know, I, I gain the benefit of having to teach this over and over again. Uh, whenever you're teaching something multiple times, obviously, it kind of gets ingrained into your brain. But uh, um, it took me a while. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It took me a while to kind of pick all this up and, and understand it. So, all right. We, so we did our verification of our type 3 LSAs. Now let's take a look at our type 4 LSAs, which we already know is a, is a link state advertisement that's going to be generated by an ABR that's attached to an area that has an ASBR in it. Okay. So... The uh, external routes that are coming in from, uh, in this particular diagram, into area 10. We've got an ASBR there that's doing redistribution. Those come in as type 5s, but that's not what we're describing here. The ABR, or excuse me, the ASBR is advertising itself within the area with type 1s. Remember, type 1s are advertised or sent out by everybody, but in this particular case, the type 1s that are generated by this a ASBR have an external flag set to ind or a flag set to indicate that it's an external router and it's generating external routes. All right? Because that flag is set when the ABR receives those type 1 LSAs, it's then going to start automatically generating type 4 LSAs 
that describe the ASBR, all right? When I say describe the ASBR, I mean literally this is the router ID for the ASBR. That's essentially what we see in our type 4s. Let's go in and take a look real quick. All right, so we'll go into uh, our database in router 4, show IP OSPF database. All right, and our, our type 4s are, not those, sorry, this one right here, summary ASB link states. That's my type 4 LSA. Uh, and if I want to drill down into that, I simply do ASBR summary. And now I can see the information about the type 4. Uh, summary ASB, Autonomous System Boundary Router. That's essentially what it is. ASBR, Autonomous System Boundary Router. This is the link ID, is the, is the router ID of the boundary router. The ABR is the one generating this. But you'll notice here we're not really seeing anything about the networks that are being sent in by the ASBR. We're just seeing basically information about the ASBR itself. The mask is a slash zero because we're, we're not really representing a network in this case. We're representing the, the, the area, the autonomous system boundary router based on its router ID. Okay, And then this is the metric uh, that we use to reach that particular destination. From router four's perspective, that is the case um, but uh, you have to understand where this Type 4 LSA is being generated from. Actually, there's a couple of things you need to understand. Let me go back to my diagram here. So R1 is sending in this Type 4 LSA into the network. Well, this is an Ethernet network. Uh, I guess I might as well tell you the formula for calculating a metric in OSPF is 10 to the power of 8 divided by the bandwidth in bits per second. Bits per second, not kilobits per second. So that would be uh, fast, e or excuse me, Ethernet would be uh, essentially seven zeros, right? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. seven. So that gives, that's what gives us the cost of 10 because fast Ethernet is, or Ethernet, excuse me, is seven zeros. Uh, that's a really important concept. Uh, you know, what happens, what do I do if it's faster than fast Ethernet? Fast Ethernet's going to have a metric of 1, um, but what do I do above that? What about gigabit Ethernet? What about 10 gig Ethernet? We'll talk about that problem a little bit later on. All right? So uh, going back to this uh, database here, we're not really seeing any information. Uh, this is not the metric to reach the ASBR. This is the metric for... Um, this is the metric for how, this is the metric that defines how far it is to get to the ABR that's attached to the area that the ASBR is attached to. Does that make sense? So it's cost me 10 to get to the ABR. And then I'm, once I get to the ABR, then I would use the corresponding type one LSAs in that area to reach the ABR, the ASBR from that perspective moving forward okay so the last one we'll take a look at is our type 5 LSAs uh, let's go ahead and uh, kind of scroll through the ones we did show IPOS PIP database summary ASB link states that's my type 4s uh, and then we did an ASBR summary to kind of drill down all right type 5 LSAs these are the link state advertisements that are being generated by the ASBR they describe the external routes and they stay type fives as they move through the autonomous system. One thing I want to say though, um, and I think it's important, is that we're assuming in this case, in, in our entire discussion, we're assuming in this case that we don't have any special area types because certain types of LSAs can never exist in certain types of special areas. So for now, we'll table the discussion about what a special area type is and, and what the restrictions of special area types are, uh, but we'll get into that a little bit later on, okay? So uh, these are generated by the ASBR. Uh, the type 4 LSA is what's generated to be able to find the ASBR, 
but the type 5 LSAs actually describe the external networks that the ASBR is redistributing into the OSPF process. So we'll go back into router 4. We're kind of looking at everything from router 4's perspective in this case. Show IP OSPF database and we see our type 5 LSAs right here. Uh, the advertising router is router 3 because that is the ASBR and then this is the network that uh, actually represents that external or that's the the link ID is the actual external network so let's see what that external network looks like I'm going to drill down into the database by looking at external uh, again the advertising router um, is is the uh, ASBR itself this is the external network number this is the subnet mask. It's coming as a, at, in as a OE2. So metric type is 2. That doesn't have anything to do with the LSA type, by the way. Uh, it has to do with whether or not this route is coming in as an external type 2 or an external type 1. This is the metric. Uh, and this is the uh, forwarding address, which is myself. I'm, origin, you know, I'm the one that's uh, sending traffic to this particular destination. All right, so those are the different LSA types that we have to deal with in OSPF. There's some other ones as well, obviously, but in the case of uh, what we're looking at in this topology, that's all we're truly concerned with right now. Uh, we'll take a look at some other types a little bit later on, like the ones that we might see for IPv6 and so on. All right, so there's our verification. We did this in the router. Subnet mask slash 16, link state ID 10.0.0.0. All right. So we just have a few more slides left uh, in this section here. So let's continue on. Uh, every single LSA, and I, and I mentioned this, uh, I kind of briefly pointed this out. We're going to be talking about those two columns, the age column and the sequence number column. Both of them are really important columns to understand. All right. Uh, with regard to the age column, uh, that is basically a way for us to represent the age of the actual LSA packet. So let's say that there is a topology change in the network. Whoever's originating that network or whoever's responsible for disseminating that information is going to advertise that change in an updated LSA to, to be able to tell everybody else what that change is. All right. Each updated LSA is going to have that incremented sequence number. So I can see in this particular case, this one is a Bravo. This one is an 8. This one is a 7. The sequence number, like I said, always starts with 8000001. So in the case of the second entry that we see in the database here, we've had seven different updates go out for that particular network. Why is that useful? Well, you really shouldn't be seeing that number go up too significantly. If you are seeing that number go up significantly, then that means that you're, you're having some convergence issues in your network. There's probably a flapping link or some sort of issue with communicating routing information. All right. Uh, essentially, any link state advertisement that has a higher sequence number is considered to be more accurate and to be the latest information. So if I'm, for example, I'm uh, receiving another advertisement from router one in this case, and the sequence number is Charlie, I'm gonna say, oh, okay, well, my information must be out of date, so I'm gonna replace the information in my database with the information that I just received. Uh, conversely, if, if I, I'm on Bravo for that particular update, and I get another update from another router with Bravo also, I'm simply going to ignore that update because I already have that sequence. All right. There is the paranoid update if the link state age reaches 30 minutes, meaning that we really didn't see any updates uh, within the last uh, half an hour. Uh, we regenerate the LSA, we increase the secret sequence number, and we flood that throughout the entire autonomous system. So you will see the sequence numbers go up, 
over a period of time. So it's not uncommon. You just don't want to see it going up significantly over a short period of time. Uh, at a minimum, it's going to go up every 30 minutes. All right. So based on the show IP OSPF database command here, we can see the different timers. Uh, and in a normal operating network, we will not see the age, uh, uh, any kind of age of higher than f uh, 1800 seconds. 1800 seconds is my, uh, is my 30 minute window for my paranoid update. By the, by the way, the age resets, right? Uh, in the process, I should have been kind of paying attention to that here. Let me see where we are in this case. So we're getting close, 1,398 seconds. Here's one that's 1,400 seconds. So in 100 seconds, uh, you can see that it's incrementing one, two seconds, one second, two seconds, one second. So eventually this will reach 1,500 and this will increment by one and this will go back to zero. So remind me, I'll go back and take a look at that in a, in a few seconds here and we can see that happening. Okay. <clears throat> One of the other things that we talked about with regard to OSPF2 is the adjacency process and, and how that adjacency process works. Uh, we start by sending out our hello packet. Uh, that's the init state. Uh, I am router ID 10.0.0.1. I see no one, so I'm going to go ahead and send my hello packet out to 224.0.0.5. All right. Now, once I receive a hello back and I recognize myself in your neighbor list, then we'll go into a two-way state. Uh, and that two-way state is bi-directional. Uh, you know, each router has to go into that two-way state. Then we go into the extern state where I start to exchange my um, uh, or start to negotiate, excuse me, who's going to be the master and the slave in the communication process. Uh, and then we go through the uh, extart state and get into the exchange state. Remember, in the exchange state, we're just simply propagating our, our, a summary of our link state database. And then based on that summary of the link state database, we can then go through the process of loading where we're actually requesting specific link state information from different routers, right? Uh, I, oh, I don't have this route. I don't have this route. I don't have this route. Can you please give me the details for that information? And then I send a link state acknowledgement indicating that I received that information. And finally, we go into the full state once we've exchanged all of our routing information. Make sense? All right. Let's take a look at our database here again, see how close we are. All right. Well, that's interesting. It did go above 1500. Why is that? Would not have expected to see that. Interesting. Hmm. We'll keep monitoring that, but uh, by definition, we really shouldn't be going above that 1500 because that indicates that we've gone beyond the 30 minute cycle. Um, that's interesting. We'll keep monitoring that, okay? Uh, I would not have expected to see that. So, uh, we already talked about this concept as well, by the way. Uh, how do we synchronize information in a multi-access network? We know that when, uh, when we want to form a relationship, a neighbor relationship in a multi-access network, that we're going to have a designated router and a backup designated router election that takes place for us to be able to identify uh, who's the chief in that particular multi-access network. We are also talked about the, the concept that the router with the highest router ID, uh, excuse me, the highest priority on the interface, uh, and in the case of a tiebreaker, the highest router ID is the one that's going to be elected as the DR potentially, right? Again, it simply matters as to uh, when these routers come online 
and, and who actually starts its OSPF process uh, first. And we also talked about the concept that it is a, a non-preemptive process, meaning that once I've been elected as a DR, I stay the DR. All right. So in this particular case, the router on the right here was elected as the DR. It's responsible for this multi-axis network. All of the other routers in this multi-axis network communicate to the DR using 224.006 or FF02 double colon six. Uh, and then the DR communicates to everybody else using 224.005 or FF02 double colon five. So, uh, uh, a link state change occurred behind router four. Rather than router four notifying everybody else in the domain, router four notifies the DR, and then it's the DR's responsibility then to go and notify everybody else. So the DR is sending out these link state updates saying, hey, there was a topology change, and then the BDR will send a link state acknowledgement back. Router three will send a link state acknowledgement back indicating that they uh, receive that information and receive that 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 update. All right. One uh, last thing that we'll talk about before we actually get into our next discovery is the shortest path first algorithm. OSPF obviously uses Dijkstra's algorithm, which is called uh, also called the shortest path first al algorithm to be able to identify paths towards the destination. Uh, now we've already somewhat learned about most of the concepts of the algorithm in a sense that uh, we, we've un we understand you know, different LSA types and we understand how the database is constructed and we've, we've already talked about how adjacencies are formed. But part of this discussion is how do we, when does the algorithm run, number one, uh, and then number two, um, how do we calculate things like the best path through our destination and so on? All right, so we're going to get into this discussion in, in our next discovery here, discovery 11, where we're going to do just like we did with the IGRP, we're going to do a path analysis and identify how metrics are calculated in OSPF, how we identify how we reach destinations and so on. All right. One of the very useful commands, which you see on the screen here, is the show IP OSPF command. Uh, from a troubleshooting perspective, this is a really important command. And let me ex explain why. Let me run it real quick on router four. Show, actually, let me just check one more thing. That's yeah, really strange. Mm, let me do something here. 30 divided by, oh, you know, 30 times 60. It shouldn't go above 1800. That's really strange. Um, yeah. That's just another one of those weird things I'm going to have to go and find out. Uh, because remember, our paranoid update is going to happen after 1800 seconds, which is our 30 minute window. Um, so, curious, very curious. All right, but anyway, let's go ahead and run our show IP OSPF command show IP OSPF. The nice thing about this particular command, they, now in the book they did a, a, a grep to begin at the area level, but I'm gonna actually show you the entire command. Uh, show IP OSPF obviously gives us some good information here. This is a process ID and my router ID. Uh, and uh, it gives us a, uh, you know different types of capabilities of the router. Um, but what's really important about this particular output, which is why they kind of jump down to the area section, is it tells us what areas the router is participating in, uh, but also it gives us information about that specific area. And I think really the most important, the most important thing for this particular output is, well, there's actually two things, but to me the most important thing are these two things right here. When was the last time I ran an SPF calculation? And how often have I run an SPF calculation within the area? Why is that particularly important? Why would I, why would I want to see that? And what would be a good value and what would be a bad value? Any ideas? Right. Well, 
Uh, yeah, you definitely want to make sure the information is accurate. We would probably have to look at our database to see that, but I don't want to be running the calculation a whole bunch of times because if I end up running this SPF calculation a bunch of times, that basically means that there's something going on in the network that's causing us to go through multiple iterations of the algorithm, right? Meaning, meaning that there's topology changes that are occurring. And, uh, topology change would initiate an SPF. Exactly, exactly. And uh, a paranoid update does not initiate an SPF calculation because, because the, uh, the link state advertisements are not actually changing. So the only time I would actually see this, uh, this, uh, this SPF algorithm being recalculated multiple times is because, uh, you know, there's some instability in the domain. Uh, another helpful thing from here is authentication as well. One of the troubleshooting tickets on the T-shoot test is an OSPF authentication ticket. So hint, hint. Uh, that would be maybe possibly something that I would, this command would be maybe something I would use to, to be able to identify that, okay? So we're gonna go into our next discovery. We don't actually have to reload the discovery in this case uh, because it's the exact same topology. So even though the, the diagram here says discovery 10, uh, it is technically also discovery 11, uh, the OSPF path selection process. So that's what we're going to take a look at real quick. Uh, and then we'll wrap up this lesson here. All right. So let's go into uh, discovery 11. In this particular discovery, we're just simply going to be analyzing the topology to take a look at routes and see how routes are propagated, how the routes are being calculated. Uh, we'll take a look at the cost of, of these routes. We'll take a look at uh, uh, cumulative path cost. Uh, and then we'll take a look at some of the restrictions for routing between these different areas. Why, why I would choose maybe an intra, intra area route over a, um, an inter area route and so on. So let's take a look. Um, let's start by kind of reviewing the topology real quick. Uh, and then we'll get into the route calculation. Now there's a couple of things that I think are important to understand before we actually get into the specifics. Uh, the, the, the two things that I mentioned when we were talking about EIGRP routes and metric calculations in EIGRP was that only egress interfaces are considered, number one, uh, and there's no floating point math, meaning that we, we drop decimal points and we, we round down to whole numbers. So just keep that, that in mind, all right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a look at the SPF calculations in R1. Uh, we'll also take a look at uh, how cost is calculated uh, in, this, um, in this particular area as well, or in this router for the, the, uh, all the destinations that the router is trying to reach. So same topology that we saw in the previous discovery. We've got some EIGRP networks that are being redistributed by router three uh, and so on. All right. So let's start by looking at our show IP OSPF uh, command on router one. Uh, and in this case, we're just trying to identify how many times the SPF algorithm has been run. We, we're choosing router one in this case uh, because router one is attached to all the areas. So it's a good place to kind of identify any instability in the network based on uh, the fact that we can see all that information for multiple areas. So here's our backbone area. Uh, we have seven LSAs. The SPF algorithm has been run four times in the backbone area. In area one, six times. Uh, in area two, three times, and so on. So that's, uh, that's why looking at this information on the area border router is very useful because you know, it actually does describe the stability of the entire OSPF topology in this particular case. So we're going to go into our Ethernet interface, show IP interface brief. And we're going to shut down Ethernet 1.0. Uh, I believe that's, yeah, that's the right one. All right. Now, obviously, if we shut down this this uh, interface, we're going to lose our adjacency to router four. Uh, but the main thing is we're trying to see what the difference is between what we saw previously in area zero, 
which in this case was executed four times. Uh, let me do a show IP OSPF and let's do a begin at backbone. All right, so now we can see executed five times. So we had four times originally. So obviously a topology change triggered an SPF calculation. Now in area one, six times, in area uh, two, three times, we can see that we weren't really affected in those areas. So the change was only localized to the area where the topology change occurred. All right. So if I do a no shot and then I go back and do the same thing, well, we got to wait till the network comes up. All right. And we till we get our adjacency. There we go. Now we can see that we've executed six times in this case. All right. So uh, obviously that demonstrates the idea of maybe a flapping link or a flapping network, uh, which would, would uh, indicate that there is something going on in our network. So we want to make sure that we don't see a whole lot of SPF calculations in, in, our, in our topology. All right. Once the link state, oh, by the way, guys, I'm not taking a break because uh, I wanted to make up the extra 15 minutes that we missed this morning. So we're just going to continue on until it's lunchtime. Uh, once the link state database has been synchronized, um, we need to be able to start to go through and calculate our routes. We need to be able to calculate the best path to our destinations and so on. All right. Uh, and in the case of OSPF, the metric that we use is a metric called. I understand that. Sorry. Uh, did you have a question, sir? So uh, the metric that we use in OSPF is a metric called cost, which is directly related to the bandwidth. Uh, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, there's a, uh, the, the previous exercise that we went through where we looked at the SPF calculation. But OSPF's uh, metric is called cost, all right? And uh, the lowest the cost, uh, the better the path. Very, very simple metric. Compared to EIGRP, the OSPF metric is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, cost is calculated by taking something called the reference bandwidth and then dividing it by the interface bandwidth. And the default reference bandwidth is 10 to the power of 8 or 100 megabits per second. Okay? So there's a couple of ways that we can manipulate the metric in OSPF. We can change the bandwidth of the interface. And by changing the bandwidth, clearly that's going to change how OSPF interprets that interface. We can change the reference bandwidth, which is actually very important. Uh, as a best practice standard, you should be changing the reference bandwidth, or we can manually set the cost on the interface. I'll, I'll demonstrate uh, all of these different options, all right? Cost value itself is a 16-bit value. Uh, it's going to go anywhere from 1 to 65,535, and then the lower the cost, the more desirable that particular path. There is a problem, though. Uh, and the problem is what the reference bandwidth is. Because the reference bandwidth is 100 megabits per second, uh, that means that anything that is 100 megabits per second or faster will have a cost of 1. Uh, because we can't do fractions, right? There's no floating point math in, in metric calculations, so I can't do decimals, and it's uh, not necessarily possible for me to even represent a decimal value in binary anyway. So uh, the problem that we run into, and you guys mentioned that your backbone is a very high-speed backbone, so you would definitely take this into account. You said about a 10 gig backbone yeah. that you guys are running. So, yeah. so uh, this is definitely something that you 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 need to consider. That. 10 gig backbone is going to have the same path cost as a 100 meg link by default because of the reference bandwidth. So as a best practice standard, we're going to definitely want to change that, uh, that value. We'll show you how to do that in a minute. Also, uh, again, no floating point mass. So if I take 10 to the power of 8, which is my reference bandwidth, 
and I divide that by 1544000. That's a T1 speed. Keep in mind, um, it's in bits per second. The, the, the uh, denominator in the formula is in bits per second, not kilobits per second. Uh, we use kilobits per second in EIGRP. Uh, in OSPF, we use bits per second. That gives me a cost of 64.766, blah, 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 blah. Obviously, in this particular case, we're just going to simply drop the uh, decimal, and we're just going to say that a T1, for example, has a cost of 64. All right? Um, and uh, whereas, say, for example, a 10 to the power of 8, a 64,000 or 64 kilobits per second link, 64 kilobits per second link, right? is going to have a cost of 1562. So we just simply drop the remainder, all right? No multiplying by 256. Uh, if I want to calculate the path cost, I simply calculate the cost of each interface, egress interface, along the path, and I add up those costs. And that becomes my overall total path cost. So basically, from the perspective of uh, a metric, uh, it's a really simple metric. Uh, especially compared to EIGRP. So let's go into our router one. We're going to take a look at our serial interface in router one. And uh, we'll do a quick uh, show interface serial two zero. And we can see that the bandwidth in this is 1544. Remember, you have to divide or multiply that times 1,000 because it's in kilobits per second, and in the formula, it's in bits per second. We already did that calculation, which was 64. So if I do a show IP OSPF interface serial to zero, you can see that it, in fact, has a cost of 64. All right? That's what they were trying to show you there. So these are some of the default costs that we deal with in OSPF, and obviously that's something that we're concerned with with regard to what do we do if we have links that are faster than fast ethernet like a 10 gig link like a 1 gig link all right uh, back in the day when OSPF was first developed this wasn't a problem because obviously back in the day we didn't have links that had this kind of speed so the solution and it has to be a common solution for all of the devices is to change the reference bandwidth now Technically, OSPF will still work even if you only change the reference bandwidth on one device, but you may get some kind of strange things happening with the routing. We may not, uh, we, we, we may see asymmetric routing or may see uh, suboptimal path selection and so on if we don't apply the same reference bandwidth on all the different routers. So let's go into router one and let's apply the reference bandwidth. Uh, it's done under the OSPF process. I'm running, do show IP protocols. I'm running OSPF1. Notice in this particular output here for show IP protocols, uh, I can see that routing is explicitly configured on the interface. So we don't have uh, network statements in this particular router. We're just simply en enabling the, the protocol on the interface. But you also notice here that we don't really see any reference to how the cost is being calculated. We don't see a reference to the reference bandwidth. Uh, and um, that's, uh, that's not something that you can actually technically see in a lot of different show outputs. But we're going to go into router OSPF1. And we're going to just simply say auto cost reference bandwidth the default value is in is a, is 100 because it's listed in megabits per second. Uh, again, I don't understand why they do that. They uh, the metric is calculated one way, but when you type it in, it's referenced in a different format. But anyway, uh, 100 megabits per second is the default. So if I want my gig links to look like one and my fast Ethernet links to look like 10, I'll make it a thousand megabits per second. If I want my 10 gig links to look like one and my one gig links to look like 10 and my fast ethernet links to look like 100, then I'll make it 10,000. And that's a pretty standard number these days is to go ahead and set the reference bandwidth to 10,000. Notice that it gives me a warning. 
uh, because we want to make sure that we have a consistent reference bandwidth across the enterprise uh, so that we know that everybody's making the same kind of routing decisions when it comes to a metric. Now if I do a show IP, uh, do a show IP OSPF interface, serial 2.0, you can see that the, the cost increased by a factor of two zeros essentially because we added two zeros to the default value. All right. Uh, definitely a best practice standard. Uh, you can see that the maximum value that we can set is pretty significant. Uh, so you could even potentially go above 10,000 if you want. Where is the, there it is. Uh, so we can go above 10,000 if we want. Um, maybe in, in anticipation that we might have terabit links at one point or even faster than that in the future. There's really no downside to making it a really large number as long as it's consistent on all the routers within your autonomous system. That's the most important thing. You want to make sure that it's, uh, that it's consistent. All right. All right. So uh, one of the other options that you have, if you don't want the router to, to use the reference bandwidth to calculate cost, uh, is you can actually just set the cost on the interface directly. So if I go into interface serial 2.0 IP, I mean, I can change the bandwidth, obviously, of the interface, which would then go into the formula and would change the overall calculation. But the problem with changing the bandwidth is that it would also possibly change how other processes in the router might look at the interface. QoS, for example, might use bandwidth to make certain decisions um, and other routing processes or other protocols or whatever might use bandwidth to make different decisions. So in OSPF, we actually have the ability to set the cost statically on the interface. Uh, again, it's a 16-bit value, so we can set it between 1 and 65,535. If I set the cost on the interface, show IP OSPF interface serial 2.0, uh, then, the, then the, the calculation goes out the window. We, we just simply ignore the calculation and we uh, just assign the cost value to that interface. All right. You can also see a summary of all the costs on your interface. We didn't see this command yesterday by doing a show IP OSPF interface brief and you can see the cost for each link. Uh, so this guy has a cost of one, this is 10,000, this is 500, this is a thousand, I mean a thousand, uh, and a thousand. So you look at the loopback and say, well, wait a minute, why does the loopback have a cost of one? Well, if I do a show um, interface loopback zero, you can see that the bandwidth is pretty significant on a loopback interface. Um, it's, what, eight million kilobits per second, so uh, that's still, even though we adjusted our thresholds, that's still uh, a pretty significant number and it still results in a, an overall cost for that interface of one. All right. I'm assuming that you guys are doing something with reference bandwidth in your topology as well, given the fact that you have 10 gig links. Maybe. Well, um, I have not seen it. No, uh, well, we're running EHRP over to the links currently. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. You mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, so we, yeah. So, so we do have one, one gigs to pit, which we're doing uh, OSDF, and, and we did not do that there. Right. Well, it's not a huge well, issue. It's not a huge issue, um, in that, unless you have ten meg links or fast Ethernet links, uh you're not really going to have a problem, and especially if they're not redundant links, right? Um, so uh, the fact that you're not changing the reference bandwidth uh, potentially is not a problem. It just depends on the overall topology. Uh, do I have parallel links? Like, for example, do I have a gig link and do I have a 10 gig link that go to the same destinations? In that case, it could be right. a big problem, right? Yeah, we have, we have uh, parallel two gig or one gig links, right? One going to Philly. You just statically set the cost. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, all right. We got a couple more things to talk about in this lesson here. Um, and let's get through our slides here. So this is the reference bandwidth command. Uh, definitely on the test, they're going to ask you about the reference bandwidth. Um, and we can obviously set the bandwidth on the interface. I used 500 as an example. In the book, they used uh, 10,000. Uh, and by setting the bandwidth, we're actually affecting the cost as well. Oh, there's one where they did 500. Okay. So the last thing we'll talk about is, is how does OSPF handle traffic flow uh, if I'm learning about routes inside my area and I'm also learning about the exact same routes outside of my area? All right. Um, so to calculate the cost of intra-area routes, routes that exist within the area, uh, we just simply add up the path cost to reach those destinations, right? The, the, the router is going to analyze the database. It's going to identify all the type 1 LSAs that are occurring within that area. And then it's going to take those, uh, the link speeds and whatnot and calculate costs to each of the destinations. So for every single destination within the area, we're going to calculate a cost, which is cumulative path cost from beginning to end based on egress interfaces only to reach that destination by summing up all of the individual interface costs along the way and that becomes the total path cost whichever path has the the lowest total path cost becomes the becomes the path that I use so let's say I had a loopback on router 1 and I'm talking about reaching that loopback from ABR2 if I took this path it'd have a total path cost of 20 if I took this diagonal path it would have a path cost of 15 so obviously in this case I would choose the path cost of 15 Pretty basic, pretty straightforward, okay? All right. Um, now, if I analyze the topology from R1's perspective, we can reach uh, an intra-area uh, intra area network A either through ABR1 or through ABR2. Uh, obviously, in this case, the path through ABR1 is associated to a lower path cost that's going to be the path that's going to be selected as my primary path. All right. If I had a scenario where both paths have the same cost, then both routes get inserted into the routing table and we do equal cost load balancing to that particular destination. All right. So, so far, so good. That makes all makes good sense. Internal. OSPF routers and routers that, that, that fall within a specific area get type 3 LSAs set into the area about my inter-area routes. And they can either represent the actual physical network, which is the default action, or they can be a summary of those other networks coming from different areas. So the cost of an inter-area route isn't calculated the same way as it is for intra-area routes. All right, very, very important concept that we're talking about here. And by the way, intra, excuse me, yeah, intra-area routes are always gonna be preferred over inter-area routes. Type, type ones are always gonna be preferred over type threes, assuming it's a route that describes the exact same destination. When the ABRs propagate their information those type three LSAs, as a summary, we talked about this the other day, uh, I think it was actually the first day we were talking about summaries. Uh, the metric for the summary is always the lowest metric for all the routes that are included in that summary. Uh, now by default, since OSPF doesn't actually technically summarize by default, the metric would actually represent the actual metric of the destination because we're going to send in a single type three for every single type one that's being generated within the area. But if I am doing manual summarization where I'm summarizing 100 routes or 50 routes or whatever it might be, um, then the metric for that summary is the best metric for all the routes that are included in that summary. Does that make sense? So the, uh, we can't always assume that that metric is 100% accurate to reach the specific destinations that the ABR is summarizing as part of that uh, summary. All right, now let's say router one in this particular example learns about network B. Network B is 
all the way over on the right hand side here attached to router one. So router one is going to learn about network B from ABR1 and it's going to learn about network B from ABR2. All right. Uh, the cost that's associated to the route from ABR2's perspective is going to be 6 and the cost from ABR1's perspective is going to be 21. Now router 1 is going to use that information to figure out okay what's the lowest cost that I need to reach the ABRs. It's going to add that cost to the one that it receives in the type 3 LSA that it gets and then we're going to select the path uh, to that destination, network B destination, based on that total lowest path cost. In this particular case, that's going to be through ABR2 because uh, the top path is going to have an overall path cost of 31. The bottom path is going to have an overall path cost of 21. So, so far, all of this makes sense. All right. But let's talk about a scenario. And, and by the way, that's assuming that we were just advertising network B into area zero as uh, as an individual route, not as a summary. All right. So oftentimes to eliminate single points of failure, to eliminate issues with routing between different domains, uh, we will institute the use of multiple ABRs to connect to the network. All right. Now this could cause potentially some problems. Um, well, there are just some caveats that you need to be concerned with. When, you, when you're dealing with this type of scenario. All right, now let's say that I've added both of these ABRs. The link on the left is in area zero, by the way. This, this one that has a cost of 10, that's in area zero. So I've implemented two different ABRs between the areas for redundancy. Uh, now ABRs can learn about routes either internally as an intra-area route, or they can learn about routes externally as an inter-area route for the exact same destination. Because remember, we, we saw this when we looked at the databases in our discovery. On the ABR, we have essentially the same route twice. We have it listed as a type 3, and we have it listed as a type 1. Okay, So even though an inter-area route could potentially have a lower cost to a specific subnet, than an intra-area path, we're always going to take that intra-area path because intra-area routes are always preferred over inter-area routes. So let's say in this example, ABR1 learns about network B directly from router 4. That's a type 1 LSA, uh, and that is a, a um, uh, that is, uh, well, it's coming into the database as a type 1 LSA intra-area LSA. But I'm also learning about the network B from ABR2. But I'm learning about it from ABR2 as a type 3 LSA, an intra-area or inter-area route. Now if I take the top path, it's going to give me a total path cost of 21. But if I take the path through ABR2, it's actually a more preferred path because the total path cost is only 16 for the bottom path. The problem is it's not the way the routing works. ABR1 is going to choose the top path in every case. You guys mentioned, I think, at one point um, that you were having, and it may not be related to this, but this is one of those things that you need to consider, that you were having problems with routing not being predictable or not taking the right path or, or whatever. Well, this is kind of one of those scenarios uh, where you could see something like this happening and you may not be aware oh yeah that's coming in as an that's coming in as an intra area route so uh, it's going to be preferred over the inter area route even though the even though the inter area route is a better path you can't override this behavior by the way what would you have to do to fix this problem you'd have to do some path manipulation you'd have to you know uh, kind of trick the router into thinking that a, that uh, one path is better than the other path. All right, um, and uh, actually, you don't probably that probably wouldn't even uh, help in this particular case because again, intra-area routes are preferred over inter-area routes, uh, and you can't change that behavior. So just something to keep in mind and consider when you're dealing with 
um, dealing with these uh, these types of design elements or these types of design scenarios in your topology. Okay, so that actually concludes lesson number two uh, in our OSPF module. Uh, in the next lesson, we're going to get into optimizing OSPF. That's going to include things like summarization. Uh, uh, we're going to take a look at summarizing on an ABR. We're also going to take a look at summarization on our autonomous system boundary routers. Uh, and then we're going to talk about default routes. How do I inject the default route? Uh, what is the default information originate command and so on? So we'll be talking about, you know, basic concepts into uh, how we can kind of optimize the operation of OSPF. Uh, and then we have one more lesson after that, uh, which is the OSPF E3 lesson. Um, we actually will be talking about special area types as well. Uh, that's a pretty important concept. What is a stub area? What is a totally stubby area? What's a not so stubby area? And finally, what's a totally not so stubby area? So uh, we'll wrap up this lesson. We'll see you guys in the next lesson.